I want to welcome you to Matthew Thiessen, Jesus and the Forces of Death. My name is John Martins, and I direct the Center for Christian Engagement at St. Mark's College. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we are gathering is traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And we're thankful for their welcome to us so that we can work here, learn here, and pray here on this land. The Center for Christian Engagement is a new center at St. Mark's that emphasizes the importance of listening, reflecting, learning, discussing, and praying as we explore the Christian and Catholic intellectual tradition and seek to learn from each other. I want to offer some thanks to those people who are supporting these lectures, Mark and Barbara Cullen and their family, who have generously donated to allow these lectures to take place. And I want to thank the donors of our center, whose generosity enables this work to take place at all. Peter Bull, Angus Reed, and Andy Zox. We're thankful for their commitment to the life of the academic world and the work of the church in the world. We're thankful for those of you who are with, with us here in person and for the many more of those who have joined us online. So Professor Thiessen is going to offer his lecture, and then we'll have time for questions. We'll also take questions um, from people online. We'll monitor those, Kevin and I, and we'll ask those as they come in. I want to introduce our speaker. Some of you here know him, and some of you were here with us yesterday. Dr. Matthew Thiessen is an Associate Professor of Religious Studies at McMaster University, where he's been since 2016. Prior to that, he was at St. Louis University, and I'm honored to have him with us. I, I will still call you a young biblical scholar, Matt. I'll do it again. Uh, one of the top young biblical scholars, not just in Canada, but in the world. Examining and helping us deepen our understanding of the deep historical relationship of Christianity to Judaism and placing Jesus and Paul in their proper theological and historical context within Second Temple Judaism. Matt was educated at Duke University, the University of Oxford, and Trinity Western University here in BC and at Tyndall College. He's the author of three major monographs, with a fourth coming soon, A Jewish Paul, the Messiah's Herald to the Gentiles. Today he's going to be speaking about his book, Jesus and the Forces of Death. So I want to spend a little time um, just reading a couple of comments regarding this. There's a lot of reviews of the book, a lot of good reviews. Andrew Cowan, writing in the Journal of Evangelical Theology, states, three primary virtues of this book should be highlighted. First and most importantly, the central thesis of the book is persuasive. That's always good. Thiessen makes a compelling case for the claim that the Jesus of the Synoptic Gospels took ritual purity seriously and worked to destroy the sources of impurity, not to discredit the concept of purity. Second, the central agenda of the book is to combat anti-Judaism in New Testament scholarship, an important task. And Thiessen effectively highlights ways in which rhetoric intended to promote the compassion of Jesus has unfairly disparaged Jesus' Jewish contemporaries. Third, each chapter provides a trove of information from ancient sources, and this gives the reader a real sense of the pervasiveness and significance of beliefs about ritual purity. Contrary to the assumption that Jewish views of ritual purity or an exception to the default view that no such thing existed, Thiessen effectively demonstrates that Jewish views were simply one variant of common beliefs about purity in the ancient world. And I will read one more comment from Marianne Blickenstaff in her review and in, uh, interpretation. This is an important book for Jewish Christian relations to be sure, because it challenges long held supersessionist views but it's also important for a better Christian understanding of what Jesus represented as God's Holy One. And therefore, it increases Christian appreciation of who Jesus was and is. Jesus' commitment to the law was absolute. He's not merely remedying ritual purity, such as lepra, genital discharge, and corpse impurity, as a priest did. He had the power to take it away altogether. Lest Christians claim that this power was an entirely new thing, Thiessen recalls that Jesus' powers had a precedent with the prophets Elijah and Elisha, who healed a person with lepra and raised people from the dead. Thus, Jesus was fully immersed and fulfilled 
fully immersed in and fulfilled the Hebrew Bible prophetic tradition that someday God will take away death itself. So please welcome Matthew Thiessen and his talk tonight. Again, I want to thank John Martins for inviting me out here and St. Mark's College for hosting this event and to each of you for coming out uh, in the flesh or, uh, well, not quite in the spirit, but via Zoom, especially on a Friday evening. <clears throat> in his 1526 lectures on the book of Jonah, Martin Luther argued that the plant that grows over Jonah's head represents Judaism. And the worm that eats and kills that plant turns out to be Jesus. These are his words. The worm Christ destroys Judaism. God appoints a worm to smite the plant. This signifies that Christ appeared with his gospel at a time when the Jews vaunted most vain gloriously that they alone were God's people. He attacked the wild plant, that is, he preached against it and abolished the law through his Holy Spirit and liberated us from the law and its power. Therefore, Judaism withered and decayed in all the world. Over 200 years later, Immanuel Kant claimed that Christianity arose quickly, completely forsaking the Judaism for which it sprang. Such claims, far from unique in Christian writings or thought, as Amy Newman has shown, belong within a larger Protestant trope about the purported death of Judaism. Not surprisingly, given the dominance of this motif in European Christian thinking, early historical Jesus scholars made similar claims. For instance, in 1863, Ernest Renan claimed the following. One idea, at least, which Jesus brought from Jerusalem, in which henceforth appears rooted in his mind, was that there was no union possible between him and the ancient Jewish religion. The abolition of the sacrifices which had caused him so much disgust, the suppression of an impious and haughty priesthood, and in a general sense, the abrogation of the law appeared to him absolutely necessary. From this time, he appears no more as a Jewish reformer, but as a destroyer of Judaism. In more recent times, numerous scholars have made analogous claims, albeit more nuanced in order to avoid the blatant anti-Judaism of these earlier writers. For example, John Dominic Crossan argues that Jesus saw himself as the functional opponent alternative and substitute to the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Well, on the other side of the theological spectrum, Tom Wright suggests that Jesus implicitly and explicitly attacked what had become standard symbols of the Second Temple Jewish worldview. He saw them not as bad in themselves, but as out of date, belonging to the period before the coming of the kingdom and to be jettisoned now that the new day had dawned. In contrast, Jewish scholars such as Joseph Klausner, David Flusser, Geza Vermesh, Paula Fredrickson, and Amy Jill Levine have long stressed the continuity between Jesus' teachings and that of his fellow Jews. And a good number of non-Jewish scholars, most notably, of course, E.P. Sanders, have sought to place Jesus within Judaism and not against it, and certainly not seeking to cause its death. This relatively recent scholarly trend is something that needs to continue to break out beyond the bounds of academic discussions into seminaries, university classrooms, pulpits, and Christian theology and thinking. And that's my hope for tonight. The Jerusalem temple was the epicenter of the cult related to the Jewish God. Well, at least for many Jews. It was the place where God had chosen to concentrate his presence on earth. Recently, or relatively recently, Simon Joseph has argued that Jesus aimed to change the Mosaic customs of the Jews by rejecting the violent blood sacrifice inherent in the temple cult. But the Gospels provide no evidence that Jesus thought that sacrifice was an inherently violent action. How do they depict Jesus' thinking about an action toward the temple? <clears throat> 
From his birth, the Gospels depict Jesus and his family behaving as though the temple is truly sacred space, a place worthy of reverence. Forty days after Jesus' birth, Joseph and Mary go to Jerusalem, undergoing ritual purification in order to enter the Jerusalem temple so that they can present Jesus to the Jewish God, all in accordance with the law, Luke repeatedly tells his readers. Of course, Jesus was 40 days old at this point, so he had no say in these actions. Immediately after this story, though, Luke depicts the 12-year-old Jesus accompanying his parents to Jerusalem for the Passover festival, something that Luke says they did annually. After Passover, Jesus remains in the temple in order to listen to and ask questions of the teachers there. His words to his mother demonstrate his thinking about the temple. Did you not know that it's necessary for me to be in my father's house? He asks. Jesus needs to be in the temple, a building that he describes as his father's house, where he amazes all who hear him speak. Luke's adolescent Jesus believes that the temple is the earthly dwelling of the Jewish God. These stories, of course, come from Luke, the latest of the Synoptic Gospels, but they fit with how Matthew depicts Jesus in his adult life. For instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's Jesus tells his hearers that if they are offering a gift at the altar, an altar that can only be the, that in, in the Jerusalem temple, but realize they need to be reconciled to another human being, they should immediately leave, be reconciled, and then return to finish up their offering. The saying casually assumes and in fact endorses cultic piety, the language of offering a gift being common to sacrificial contexts, whether of meat or grains. The reason Jesus assumes the value of cultic piety can be seen later in Matthew's Gospel. For in talking about oath practices, he claims that the temple's altar actually makes what is offered on it holy. The altar then is infused with holy power, and this is Jesus argues, because the sanctuary which houses the altar is the place where the Jewish God actually dwells. Again, this is from the Gospel of Matthew. What about the Gospel of Mark, the earliest of the Gospels? Jesus says nothing explicit about the temple until his first trip in the narrative to Jerusalem. There he enters the temple where he creates an incident, disrupting the business taking place in one section of it. Quoting the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah, Mark's Jesus expresses his anger at what he perceives to be actions that have turned the house of the Jewish God from a place of prayer into a den of thieves. So seriously, then, does Jesus take the belief that the Jewish God dwells in the Jerusalem temple that he angrily chastises people for what he perceives to be their deep irreverence for holy space. For the Jesus of the Gospels, then, the Jerusalem temple is God's house and must be treated as holy space. The assumption that the Jerusalem temple is the dwelling place of the Jewish God can be seen in another aspect related to Jesus in the Jewish cult. And this makes up the bulk of my book, Jesus and the Forces of Death. The ritual purity system. Virtually all ancient Mediterranean cultures constructed such systems. But for Jews, ritual impurity arose from three distinct sources. What the Greek translators of Leviticus call lepra, genital discharges of blood or semen, and corpses. Significantly, Mark, Matthew, and Luke depict Jesus coming into contact with the impurity created by each of these three physical sources. Before diving into the Gospels, though, I think it's important to stress just how common it is for Christian interpreters to conclude that Jesus rejected the ritual purity system. Again, remember Crossan's words, Jesus saw himself as the functional opponent and alternative and substitute to the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. And Marcus Borg has argued that Jesus envisaged, envisaged a community shaped not by the ethos and politics of purity, but by the ethos and politics of compassion. And Richard Beck makes a similar contrast. It's a lengthy quotation. Sacrifice, the purity impulse, marks off a zone of holiness, admitting the clean and expelling the unclean. Mercy, by contrast, crosses those purity boundaries. Mercy blurs the distinction, bringing clean and unclean into contact. Thus the tension 
One impulse, holiness and purity, erects boundaries, while the other impulse, mercy and hospitality, crosses and ignores those boundaries. Such arguments are indebted to a larger theological agenda that equates Jesus and Christianity with compassionate love on the one hand, and Judaism with sterile, heartless law observance on the other hand. As such, they are religious apologetics masquerading as historical research. This is not history, Paula Fredrickson argues, nor is it realistic description. It is caricature generated by abstractions whereby a set of politically and ethically pleasant attributes define both Jesus and negatively the majority of his Jewish contemporaries. Let us try to imaginatively step into the world of ancient Jewish purity thinking. First, God has structured the world in a variety of ways, but perhaps most fundamental for Israel's existence is its structure around two different binaries, the holy and profane, and the pure and the impure. The central text for this map came when God consecrated Israel's priests, setting them apart from lay Israelites. At that time, God informed the priests of their essential role in Israelite society. Leviticus 10.10 10 puts it this way to the priests. This is their key role. You are to distinguish between the holy and profane and between the impure and the pure. These categories should not be equated with one another, as many readers of these texts have assumed. The word holy is not synonymous with pure, nor is the word profane synonymous with the word impure. The category of the holy pertains to that which is for special use, in this sense related to Israel's cult and therefore to Israel's God. On the other hand, the category of the profane refers to that which is secular or for common use. Here, the English word, or the English use of the word profane to refer to bad language might unfortunately lead to confusion. There's nothing dirty, impure, or sinful about something being profane. Just a neutral category. This first binary provides one map of the entire world. All things are either holy or profane, and most things are profane. For example, six days of the week are profane, as are non-cultic Israelite buildings. Those six days aren't, apart from Monday, uh, aren't bad. An object or a person cannot be both holy and profane at the same time. But, as we will see, it's dangerous and possibly sinful when something holy, such as the temple or Sabbath, is profaned, or when something profane encroaches upon something holy. The second map of the world is constructed by the categories of the pure and impure. And again, all things are either pure or impure. Um, and most things, uh, it doesn't matter if they're impure. It's only as they come into contact with the holy that it's ma it matters. So there are four distinct categories, holy, profane, pure, and impure. Within this map, which divides the worlds into realms of holy and profane and pure and impure, it's necessary to drill down into one particular category more in depth, the category of the impure. Numerous scholars have argued that there are two types of impurity in Leviticus, and they argue over uh, how to label them, but I think it's most common to label them ritual and moral, ritual impurity and moral impurity. Unfortunately, here too, people frequently confuse these two forms of impurity, leading to numerous sort of mapping errors. Jonathan Klawans has provided a helpful comparison of these two forms of impurity that can be compared in this way. Uh, I'll list them. Ritual impurity is unavoidable. If you're mortal, you're going to become ritually impure if you're an Israelite. It comes from a natural substance. It's communicable or contagious. It's bathed away, it's not an abomination, and it's not sinful. Moral impurity, on the other hand, is avoidable, at least in theory. It comes from an action, it's non-communicable or non-contagious, uh, it can be atoned for, or uh, one can endure punishment for it, and it is sinful. This compar comparison highlights key differences between moral impurity, which is sinful, and ritual impurity, which isn't or at least isn't inherently. And I think that's really important uh, 
to stress. It is very common for people to take ritual impurity as something that, that was sinful. It's not. On the basis of ancient portrayals of those suffering from lepra, the skin condition or series of skin conditions, it's not leprosy. Unfortunately, most uh, English translations get this wrong. Uh, I used to say all English translations, but the latest uh, edition of the NRSV, the NRS VU, VU? How's it pronounced? VUE. Uh, the updated edition has finally changed uh, that. It's not leprosy anymore. Um, I forget what they call it. Something like scale disease, but it's not, I don't think they call it that. Uh, sorry. On the basis of ancient portrayals of those suffering from this series of skin conditions, Jacob Milgram argues that what these three sources of ritual impurity share in common is that they represent death. The corpse, obviously, is a dead body. That doesn't need much uh, elucidation. The lepros, that's the one suffering from lepra, looks corpse-like, has flaky white skin that looks corpse-like. And those who experience a genital discharge suffer the loss of life force contained in genital blood or semen. From this observation, Milgram concludes that in Jewish thinking, ritual impurities have some sort of symbolic significance. They represent the forces of death. With this in mind, I think it's time to turn to the Gospels. In Mark's Gospel, one of the very first deeds of power that Jesus performs relates to a lepros, a man suffering from this skin condition. I'll read the story. I think it's great for getting us into this topic. And a lepros came to him, Jesus, begging him and saying to him, if you desire, you can purify me. And now there's a textual issue, but I'm going to go with uh, a poorly attested uh, variant because I think it's, it's more difficult. Angered, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I desire, be pure. And immediately the leper left him and he was purified. In growling at him, Jesus immediately cast him away and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your purification what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Instead, the man went out and began to talk about it and to spread the news with the result that Jesus was no longer able to enter into a town openly, but stayed outside in deserted places. The story as Mark frames it focuses on Jesus' attitude toward ritual impurity. This is, after all, the first story in which a ritually impure person encounters Jesus. The very fact that the man is unsure whether Jesus desires to move, remove lepra demonstrates that Mark wishes to set the record straight. Presumably, the man gives voice to a question or criticism that Mark believes was aimed at Jesus. And I think it's the man's uncertainty that angers Jesus because Mark thinks it's absurd that anyone would harbor doubts about Jesus' view of ritual impurity. For Mark's Jesus, ritual impurity is something real. It's a substance or miasma that actually exists in nature. And it's of such consequence that Jesus desires to purify those who suffer from it, becoming angry at the thought that anyone would believe otherwise. His response again focuses the reader's attention on Jesus' desire. Jesus says, I want to be purified. Such a charged encounter between the lepros and Jesus demonstrates the falsity of scholarly claims that Mark's Jesus was indifferent to or intended to subvert the laws pertaining to ritual impurity. But Jesus' concern for purity doesn't end there. Instead of telling the man that he is pure and can now resume his regular life in the Jewish community, Jesus casts the man away. The Greek is ekbalo, the same language for exercising demons, um, to cast out, telling him to show himself to the priest and to bring the offering required for ritual purification, according to Leviticus 14. Mark's depiction of Jesus' interactions with the lepros perfectly fits the first stages of purification that Leviticus outlines. The person is 
first purified of the polluting condition, the underlying condition, and only then must be checked out by a priest and offer sacrifices under the priest's direction. Finally, entering the community seven days after the underlying condition is removed. So there's like a residual impurity of a lesser form that exists after uh, the initial condition, the underlying condition is, is uh, treated. Here, Jesus does not take upon himself the priestly prerogative of declaring someone pure or impure. Rather, he sends him to the priest for such a pronouncement. This action fits with ancient Jewish concerns, which do not permit uh, non-priests to make such declarations. Jesus defers to the legislation of Leviticus 13 and 14, which states that only the priest may make these diagnosis, diagnoses. Since Jesus isn't a priest, at least in Mark, Luke's maybe another story, he cannot declare the man pure. Jesus then fits within this larger stream of Jewish thinking about the de declarative or diagnostic role that priests play with regard to lepra. In spite of this rather clear portrayal, at least clear to my mind, uh, of Jesus' observance of Leviticus 13 and 14, inter interpreters frequently suggest that aspects of the story show that Jesus rejected ritual purity laws. With regard to Jesus' command to go to the priest, Edwin Broadhead asserts, Jesus sends the one declared clean specifically to the priest who had declared him unclean. There, he is to bear witness to the power of Jesus and, by implication, to the impotence of the priest. That's an inference that Broadhead makes. That's not something Mark necessarily implies. Numerous interpreters essentially agree with this conclusion. Again, Simon Joseph observes, well, Mark doesn't tell us that the man actually went to the priests or performed any sacrifices. Yet such an observation says nothing, of course, about Jesus. After all, Jesus explicitly commands the man to offer precisely what Moses prescribes. Jesus intends for him to fulfill the laws pertaining to lepra impurity. The man in his perhaps justifiable exuberance disobeys Jesus. But to conclude from this disobedience that neither Jesus nor Mark cares about the offerings required once one becomes purified is as preposterous as concluding that Jesus and Mark don't care about what one does with one's money since the rich man refuses to give his wealth away in order to follow Jesus. In fact, the man's disobedience could be Mark's way of implying that the misconception that Jesus disregarded ritual purity stems not from Jesus' own actions or teachings, but from the fact that this man didn't do as Jesus commanded. Jesus intended for the man to obey the laws of Moses and to show the priest that he too subscribed to them, but the man's disobedience led to later misunderstandings between Jesus and the priests. Other readers suggest that Mark's Jesus doesn't care about the laws of ritual impurity because, according to Mark, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched the lepros, the impure man. But touching a person who has lepra isn't sinful. It's not prohibited. One only needs to be careful neither to transmit that impurity into sacred space, nor to handle sacred vessels or food. If Mark believes that Jesus became impure through contact with the lepros, and I think uh, one could potentially make that argument, but Mark is silent on it, this belief does not entail the conclusion that Jesus rejected the law. Mark intends to show that Jesus is doing something related to, but different from, the priestly service. Jesus' actions do not demonstrate, contrary to Crossan, that he was the opponent, alternative, or substitute to the Jerusalem temple. After all, Jesus does one thing and sends the man to the temple. Nowhere in priestly literature or Second Temple Jewish texts do priests possess the ability to remove lepra. They only diagnose. That's their one God-ordained job, according to Leviticus, not to cure just to diagnose you have it or you don't have it. In this story, then, Mark emphasizes that Jesus' actions both conform to the legislation of Leviticus and demonstrate his commitment to the temple cult and ritual purity system. By placing this miraculous cleansing early in his narrative and before the series of controversy stories in Mark 2 and 3, Mark aims to ensure that his readers will witness Jesus' reverence for the Jewish law. In fact, Jesus' commands to the man surely connect to and help answer the question with which the narrative begins. Does Jesus desire the removal of ritual impurity? 
or is he indifferent to the whole ritual impurity system? Consequently, the testimony that this purified man gives does not pertain to Jesus' ability to rid someone of ritual impurity. He never asked Jesus, are you able to? It's, do you want to? Through his interaction with Jesus, the former lepros has moved toward purity. Jesus destroys the impurity creating condition, allowing the man to now observe the regulations of Leviticus 14. In showing the priest the tangible evidence that he no longer suffers from lepra, the man would have enabled the priest to see and acknowledge that Jesus is involved in a powerful purification mission. As Joel Marcus notes, the story is dominated by the motif of cleansing. You were able to cleanse me, be cleansed, he was cleansed, offer for your cleansing. But it is also dominated by the motif of desire, if you desire, and then an emphatic, I desire. Far from being indifferent to ritual impurity, then an angry Jesus wages war in Mark's gospel against the sources of ritual impurity. This war picks up again in Mark 5, uh, a chapter that I think is the great purification chapter in Mark. Mark also depicts Jesus interacting with a woman who, woman who suffers from another source of ritual impurity, a long-term genital discharge of blood, Mark 5. 25 through 34. He describes the woman in the following way. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And she had endured much under numerous doctors and spent all she had and gained no benefit, but had in fact grown worse. Pretty dire situation. Hearing about Jesus and coming behind him in the crowd, she touched his clothing. For she told herself, if I just touch his clothing, then I will be saved or healed. The Greek is sozo. And immediately her flow of blood dried up, and she knew in her body that she had been healed of her affliction. And immediately knowing in himself that power had departed from him, Jesus turned around in the crowd and asked, who, who touches my clothes? Or who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you can see the crowd milling about you, and yet you asked, who touched me? And he looked to see who had done this thing. And the woman, frightened and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell before him and told him the whole truth. And he said, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed from your affliction. Again, numerous Christian interpreters have suggested that this story demonstrates Jesus' laxity toward and perhaps even disdain for the Jewish ritual purity system. Such scholars usually point to three details within the text as evidence for their conclusions. The woman's supposed disregard for the need to dwell in seclusion or quarantine while she suffers from this impurity, her negligence in conveying impurity toward others. After all, she enters a large crowd where she no doubt made contact with numerous people and chooses to touch Jesus' clothing. And third, Jesus' own disregard for ritual impurity as seen in his evident lack of concern that an impure woman has touched him. Again, I think such readings fundamentally misunderstand both the Jewish ritual purity system and the point of Mark's story. How does the woman's behavior have implications for what Jesus thinks or does? First of all. Second, uh, question of quarantine or seclusion. It is true that the temple scroll repeatedly portrays the quarantine of women. And Josephus claims that Moses prohibited menstruants from entering into the city of Jerusalem. This woman uh, has a greater impurity than menstruation. Uh, she's what's called in later rabbinic tradition as a va, a, a genital discharger. But while these texts seem to stipulate that those who bear particular kinds of impurity need to be isolated in certain contexts, Jerusalem, perhaps, or the wilderness camp, such a requirement was probably idealistic in terms of the entire Jewish community. We actually don't know what common Jewish practice was. Perhaps some people or community pra communities practiced such isolation, but we can't know what all Jews thought of such an interpretation or such a practice. Since Leviticus 15 does not include such legislation, undoubtedly a good number of Jews did not follow this expansionist vision. In other words, some Jews may have thought that this woman should isolate herself from the broader society, but other Jews 
didn't. Yet still others might have required isolation only when the woman came to a city or maybe specifically to Jerusalem you know, because of its proximity to the temple. Different legal positions and practices likely existed and proponents of each position would have been able to appeal to sacred texts to make their case. Thus the woman's presence among other people says nothing about her own law observance. Even more, her presence, of course, in public tells us nothing about Mark's view of this legislation. But the woman not only moves around in public in a state of ritual impurity, she also deliberately touches Jesus, despite her impurity. Consequently, some scholars conclude that the woman was guilty of transgressing Torah. From this understanding of this woman's actions, scholars draw a larger conclusion about Mark and his community. William Loder puts it in this way based on this concluding from the story. It's even probable that for Mark, menstruants were no longer considered unclean, and that for him the issue was only the healing, not removing for the woman a hurdle for which, which for Mark no longer had validity. Mark may have been aware of the way Jewish purity concerns would have had a bearing on various aspects of the story, but his silence is best interpreted on the basis that for him, such requirements no longer matter. Ultimately, Loder concludes, Mark's silences also imply that for him, Jesus gave such provisions no regard. These remarks reveal, I think, an unfortunate and widespread misunderstanding about ritual impurity. Again, uh, and I think this needs to be hammered home, to contract ritual impurity is not to sin within Jewish thinking. The woman herself is neither guilty for being ritually impure nor guilty for touching a ritually pure person. What's more, the person who contracts a lesser degree of impurity through contact with a genital discharger is also not guilty. There's no sin involved. Ritual impurity has nothing to do with guilt or sin unless one brings it into the wrong context, that is, into the sacred space, into the temple precincts. Ritual impurity and moral impurity are two different categories, although they do overlap at times, uh, especially when you bring in ritual impurity into the wrong place. The woman who suffers a ritual impurity is not guilty of sin, but were the same woman to enter into the courtyard for women at the Jerusalem temple, she would wrongfully encroach upon holy space. <clears throat> Further, Mark's narrative stresses that it is the woman herself who, in, who initiates contact with Jesus, and even this is done tentatively, touching only his clothing. Whatever the story is about, it is clearly not focused on Jesus' beliefs about the Jewish purity system. The woman's contact, according to the way Mark tells the story, Matthew changes this up a bit, Luke follows Mark here. The woman's contact causes an uncontrolled and unintended power to discharge from Jesus' body. Jesus doesn't choose to heal her. She's just healed from touching him. In no way then does this story say anything about Mark's understanding of Jesus' motives or legal positions with regard to general discharges. This last point brings us to the final aspect of the story that people think demonstrates Jesus' indifference to ritual impurity. Jesus doesn't criticize her for touching him. For instance, Adela Collins claims that the story portrays Jesus as relatively indifferent based on this silence, not criticizing her, indifferent to the issue of the transmission of ritual impurity due to genital discharges. I'm going to skip forward a little bit. I'm a little bit concerned about time here. Again, there's no criticism because there's no sin involved. Mark's portrayal of the hemorrhaging woman highlights the fact that she has had this disease for 12 years. For over a decade, she has suffered a ritual impurity that while not necessarily restricting her regular day-to-day -day movements, did prevent her access to the Jerusalem temple, maybe even to the city of Jerusalem itself. Being impure, she couldn't enter into the court of women outside of God's temple. Most Jews surely would have viewed this restriction from the temple negatively. What a loss to her. As the psalmist exclaims, better is one day in your courtyards than a thousand elsewhere, better to be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. If this woman was devoted to the Jerusalem temple, then she would have longed to enter into the temple grounds to take part in sacrifices, worship, and annual festivals that occurred within sacred space. Many of the people who endured long-term lepra 
or people who endured long-term genital discharges would have shared this desire. But to conclude from this yearning that any of them would desire the abolishment of the ritual, pur sorry, ritual purity system uh, seems incorrect. While the rules excluded them from sacred space, and depending upon which stream of Jewish purity thought they belonged to, may have put other limitations on their actions and movements, such laws were set in place out of concern for God's presence and compassion for those suffering impurities. If you bring your impurities into the temple, you're in danger, mortal danger. It's a protective prohibition. This woman did not seek the abolishment of the ritual purity system, rather she sought the destruction of a disease that had consigned her to 12 years of long-term impurity. It's both unhelpful and inaccurate, therefore, to contrast a system of purity and holiness, the Levitical purity system, with a system of compassion, the gospel portrayals of Jesus, as does Marcus Borg. Only through careful instruction and subsequent legal observance could Israel hope to live in such close proximity to its holy God, while continuing to endure a mortal existence that was frequently marked by ritual impurities. Okay. One more story. When modern readers encounter stories of Jesus raising the dead, they are struck by the miraculous nature of such deeds, and rightly so. Ancient readers would have been struck by this as well, as well, of course. As a rule, the dead don't rise again. But it is likely that they would have also connected such actions to various ritual purity systems, almost all of which in the ancient Mediterranean would have ascribed impurity to human corpses. This wasn't just a Jewish thought. Again, a failure to read these revivication stories within the context of the Jewish ritual purity system effectively removes Jesus from the world of the first century and transplants him to our own world. The various laws pertaining to corpse impurity illuminate a number of different stories in the Gospels. And I'm going to focus really just on one, the story of Jairus' 12-year-old daughter in Mark 5. Matthew and Luke retell the story. Luke tells another story of uh, the son of a widow who's died, and John, the one story of ritual purification in the Gospel of John, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. According to Mark, a synagogue ruler by the name of Jairus approached Jesus to ask him to heal his deathly daughter, deathly ill daughter, sorry. He says to Jesus, my daughter is at the point of death. Come and place your hands on her so that she might be saved and live. Just like with the lepros in Mark 1, so it is with Jairus. He's convinced that Jesus' touch alone would save his daughter from death, demonstrating his remarkable confidence in Jesus' power. The story of the hemorrhaging woman interrupts this story about Jairus' daughter, but once Mark resumes it, his readers find out that the 12-year-old girl has in fact died before Jesus can get to her. Despite this news, Jairus, Jesus, and three disciples continue to his house. Mark depicts Jesus entering the house, thereby at least appearing to contract corpse impurity, which shoots out everywhere inside of a, uh, a building. Since the corpse impurity fills the entire structure, all who enter into it become contaminated by the corpse of the young girl with a seven day impurity. Amy Jill Levine says of the story, the text of course says nothing about corpse uncleanness. And from this, she concludes that it's probably an overreading to connect it to ritual impurity. But I think her conclusion from this silence is unwarranted. All those familiar with Jewish customs in scriptures would have associated this story with Numbers 19 and the broader uh, custom of, of uh, expecting corpse contamination. And you didn't even have to be Jewish. Pretty much everybody thought corpses contaminated. Second, Mark, in following him, Matthew and Luke, placed the story of this little girl around the story of the hemorrhaging woman, connecting two females who endure two different ritual impurities. This is either a rather singular coincidence or the result of Mark's intentional effort to focus on ritual impurity, bringing two stories together, weaving them together. And given the fact that the entirety of Mark 5 contains numerous impurities, impure spirits, impure pigs, impure graveyards, a hemorrhaging woman and a corpse, 
it seems likely that Mark is really focused in here on ritual impurity. Once again, there's nothing unlawful or sinful about Jesus contracting corpse impurity from the dead girl. While a priest or the high priest or a Nazarite might face restrictions around corpse contamination, most Jews didn't. Consequently, his entering into a house containing a corpse again says nothing about his view of the ritual purity system. After all, the mourners whom Jesus first encounters when entering the house have also become ritually impure. Surely they're not guilty of disregarding the laws of corpse contamination. Further, since he has already entered into the house that is permeated by corpse impurity, the fact that he touches the girl's dead body doesn't signal any disdain for the law. So you're not more impure just for touching a corpse. Mark states that after removing the mourners, Jesus takes the dead girl's hand and says in Aramaic, Talitha kum, little girl, arise. At these words, the girl arises and begins to walk to the amazement of all. Again, the purity legislation assumes that the body of a dead person is going to convey impurity to the pure. Jesus should have become impure. Yet Jesus' encounter with the dead girl ends with her alive and walking. His touch and words revivify her. The girl's body has been separated from the source of her impurity, death. She's no longer a corpse. This revivic revivification is both miraculous and previously unimagined in priestly laws pertaining to corpse impurity. Of course, we have corpses getting raised by Elijah and Elisha. All of these people, the lepros, the hemorrhaging woman, and this dead young girl, were ritually at ritually, sorry, ritually impure at the time they encounter Jesus. At no point does Jesus tell them not to worry about being ritually impure. Not once does he deny the existence of impurity and not once does he break the law in relation to these various people. After all, touching or being touched by people who are ritually impure, neither is a breach of the law, nor is it sinful. I've said it a lot of times tonight. What Jesus does willingly or otherwise uh, is remove the sources of impurity that make people ritually impure. And once these sources of impurity have been dealt with, these various people find themselves able to undergo the minor purification rites that remove the residual ritual impurities and then re-enter into the temple precincts. In other words, these stories, these various stories demonstrate Jesus' belief, at least according to the Gospels, in the existence of ritual impurity. It exists, it's real, it's important, and it needs to be removed his opposition to its causes, almost as though he wants people to be free of ritual impurity so that they can visit the Jerusalem temple. I'm going to skip to the conclusion here. So we return to the beginning, thinking about Luther's words and Kant's words and Renan's words about Jesus wanting to destroy Judaism. Did Jesus reject Judaism? Did he reject the Jewish law? in the cult associated with the Jewish God. As Amy Jill Levine concludes, the Gospels and Acts depict Jesus, his family, and his followers as worshiping in the temple and participating in the temple sacrificial system. So the answer, at least according to the Gospels, uh, the historical Jesus is another question that I'm not asking tonight. Uh, the answer to my mind is a clear no. In his important study, though, on ritual impurity and Jesus, Thomas Kazin suggests that Jesus repeatedly demonstrates laxity toward the Jewish ritual purity system. The reason for this supposed laxity, Kazin concludes, is that Jesus was part of a moral trajectory which placed relative importance on ethics, which did not allow purity rules to intervene with social network, table fellowship, and community because his eschatological outlook made impurity subordinate to the kingdom. Kaysen's conclusion suggests that Jesus and his followers thought that ritual purity had become, as a result of the inbreaking of God's kingdom, less important than it once was. I, in contrast, would suggest that ritual impurity remained of fundamental importance for the gospel writers, but they were convinced that God had introduced something relatively new into the world, uh, evoking Elisha and Elijah, mind you, so not entirely new, into the world to deal with the sources of these impurities, Jesus by inserting a new, mobile, and powerfully contagious force of holiness into the world, Israel's God has signaled the very coming of the kingdom, a kingdom of holiness in life 
that through the mission of Jesus overwhelms the forces and sources of impurity and death, be they pneumatic, ritual, or moral. Throughout his narrative of Jesus' life, Mark repeatedly depicts Jesus overcoming impurity after impurity. This dramatic story culminates in Jesus facing off with death, death itself in his crucifixion, seemingly taking ritual impurity into his own body, only once again and with finality to come out victorious when Israel's God raises him from the dead, which of course in Mark we just get an empty tomb. How did the gospel writers understand Jesus in relation to the Jerusalem temple? Simply put, they saw no, or at least no need for, opposition between Jesus and the law, or Jesus in the temple, or Jesus and the priests. Fundamentally, they are all on the same side in a battle, a battle between Israel's God and the forces of impurity and death. They're all empowered for this battle by Israel's God, who as the source of all holiness opposed any and all impurity. In Jewish thinking, the Jewish, sorry, in Jewish thinking, the Jerusalem temple functioned because God empowered it to function. He was that sort of battery, charging it. God dwelled there, and so the temple itself was holy and needed to be protected against impurity. And God created a priestly caste of Israelites who could perform God-given rites to remove impurities that built up in the temple complex. Further, God also gave various purification rites for Israelites whose bodies became impure. Over and over again in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, as well as a host of other books, emphasize that Israel's laws come from Israel's God. These texts claim that the tabernacle and temple cult had its basis in the divine will and was animated by that divine presence. The tabernacle and then later temple were the divinely given tools to deal with impurities as they arose. But the functions that God gave to the Jerusalem temple and its priests were predominantly defensive. Impurities are going to come into existence. The temple was there to help scrub them out. They had a divinely ordained uh, role. They could not and were never meant to wipe out death itself or cure lepra or address the human conditions that results or resulted in various genital discharges. The temple could not eradicate the sources of ritual impurity, but it could eliminate the after effects once those sources of impurity left a person's body. This remark might sound like a criticism, but I, I don't think it is. It's rather a recognition of what texts like Leviticus and Numbers claim about the efficacy of the temple and its rites. They were inherently and divinely intended to have limitations. Or really, it's just that the limitations is humans are limited. They're mortal and thus produce ritual impurities. The Synoptic Gospel writers, though, would have their readers believe that Israel's God has unleashed a force of holiness in the world that goes on the offense against impurity. Jesus is the Holy One of God, Mark claims, and a holy power emanates out of Jesus' body and can overcome even the sources of impurity. He embodies God's holiness let loose on earth. Whereas the temple apparatus removes the effects of sources of impurity, Jesus addresses the sources of impurity themselves. In this way, they're a concerted force, I think, in the Gospels. Thank you. So we do have time for some questions. Um, <clears throat> we'll monitor them coming in. And uh, Harry, you have a question. So uh, I, I teach at a more liberal Protestant seminary, and uh, so uh, Cross and Inborg are uh, uh, like uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then there's John and Marcus, um, and uh, the sort of the uh, so-called progressive left um, uses these stories um, to sort of um, compare and contrast uh, what an inclusive religion looks like, which is a one that uh, rejects purity, and what uh, non-inclusive religion looks like, namely Christianity on the right or Roman yeah. Catholicism, yep. which uh, then uh, is uh, everything that is wrong uh, with with the world. So um, I, I I really appreciate uh, what you're doing here, uh, and uh, it's it's for me it is a never-ending battle to. Uh, 
try to make the points that you're trying to make. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to commend you for that. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't want to give a whole speech here, but I do want to ask the question. Yeah. I, 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 I do want to ask the question, um, how do these stories function in a post-temple system? So the Synoptic Gospels are written uh, post the destruction of the temple. And how do these stories, um, how, how, how would these stories be received in the diaspora uh, if there are Jews and Gentiles uh, who are gathering together? Yeah. How are these stories functioning? So that, that's my main, my main query about for, for, from you, actually. Yeah. If, if Jesus is indeed sort of... Uh, mobile holiness um, what why why are we having these stories about the temples this historical memory is that yeah. what's happening here what, what's uh, going on here thank you yeah um, so you know I, <laughs> as I was walking over I realized there was something I, I didn't stress that I really wanted to stress in this paper and you've just uh, lobbed me the ball so thanks for that Harry um, so this is how I think I think there are a few things one can say. So the temple's gone. You don't need to worry about ritual purity that much if you're a Jew, because you can't go to the temple. Um, so what does ritual purity no longer matter? And I think that's a possible conclusion one could draw, and maybe some did, and definitely some later Christians did this. I should say, actually, a real shout out here to Holger Zelenton has a book coming out next month uh, it's about 400 pages long, and it's about purity from Leviticus all the way to the Quran. And so it's going to be fantastic, um, ritual purity. Uh, so I think this is going to help us answer some of those questions about how do, how do later Christians use these texts. Um, but this is what I would, I would say initially, Harry. Um, if Milgram is right, and there's debate about this, that ritual impurity signifies death, or at least mortality, the mortal condition, these stories are, I think, functioning to really impress upon readers that uh, followers of Jesus should expect to be victorious over death themselves. So these stories, they're about ritual impurity, but they're also, they have this larger sort of theological significance that matters even if you're a Gentile and unrelated to the temple, uh, Jesus wins over death. And he was doing it when he was alive, and walking on the earth, uh, and he's been resurrected, and you're going to get that too. That power is going to be there for you at some point. So I think that's sort of the larger theological I, movement of the narrative. There's this broad purification mission, and it's eschatological. It's ultimately Israel's God uh, winning over death and finally destroying death, um, which maybe then if you believe that, you think, well, these things don't matter as much anymore. Um, I'll note in the uh, Didascalia Apostolorum, an early Christian text, there's a debate about uh, whether menstruants should take communion. And so there are clearly some women who aren't and aren't praying during menstruation because they think they've lost the Holy Spirit. They think they're impure. And uh, the Didascalia Apostolorum says, no, 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 <laughs> keep taking communion or keep praying. There's, there actually, there's actually multiple uh, positions on it, sort of Christian halak positions on it. Um, but it seems like the argument is, it's not that these impurities don't exist or don't matter. It's that you've been infused with a source of holiness that's even more powerful than the impurities. So it cancels out. It, it overwhelms the impurity and sort of nullifies its power. They exist, but they're not as powerful as the Holy Spirit, in other words. So there's actually the this, this same game of holiness. It's, so Milgram argues that holiness and impurity are two forces that are opposed to each other, dynamic forces. And holiness is pushing impurity or overwhelming it so it no longer, no longer matters. So I think that's, again, part of what maybe what... Um, how people would use these stories about Jesus. Yeah, that helps. Thanks for your questions. Yeah, right behind you here. Yeah, thank you, Dr.
your lecture is so interesting. And um, I'm just wondering, uh, what do you think the relationship between impurity and the holiness in the temple? Because we know from the um, many stories in the gospel that those who have a disease, like a leprosy and yeah. um, et cetera, et cetera, they cannot enter the uh, temple, right? Yeah. And um, uh, I'm wondering, what is the relationship between their disease so that they have a, they, they are claimed as a impure yeah. and the holiness in the temple? Why should be they, like, disease is not always sin, right? Yeah, it's not sin. Yeah, it's Definitely not, not sin. Yeah. yeah. But why they should be like excluded from the yeah. uh, community yep. or the holiness in the temple? Yeah. So yep. yeah, yeah. This is a great, I think, really, really good question to ask and think about. According to Israel's priests, uh, so this is how I talk about the priestly God in in uh, the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. He's a neat freak. He's really tidy, and he can't take a mess. And so humans are mortal and messy, but God wants to live with them. And so he sets up a neat, tidy space, the temple or, or tabernacle. And it's got to stay tidy or, or God gets antsy and leaves, which we get in Ezekiel. The temple gets overwhelmed with impurities and God has to sort of, he flies off. Um, so there, there are sort of two different dynamics to the temple. One is it's a neat, tidy place for God to dwell with me close to messy humans. And there are sort of mechanisms in place to keep it from getting too messy. Impurities build up, but they get washed out, scrubbed out with ritual detergent of blood uh, on a regular basis. And that keeps God relatively comfortable um, on earth. The other factor is if you bring these ritual impurities in, uh, it's a volatile situation. So Hannah Harrington makes the argument that holiness, and so Israel's God is holy, it, it's much like uh, radioactivity. It's a very powerful thing that can be used for good, but if approached wrongly, it's very dangerous. And that's definitely uh, the God of, of Israel's priests. You have to approach this God with care. Uh, and God, I think, compassionately gives, here are the guidelines for doing it. You can do it. Here are the ways to do it safely. If you come at it the wrong way, you're in trouble. So uh, this goes to, to Harry's point about exclusion. It's exclusion, but it's exclusion. It's a protective exclusion. Uh, don't come in here in the wrong way or it's going to go badly for you. Uh, so I don't know if that gets to your question, but... I, I, I take it that, and so it's more mortality versus immortality. The immortal, undying God has to be somehow distanced a little bit from mortal humans who are messy. And so that's why they can't bring in corpses, genital discharges, and lepra, because these all represent uh, or are associated with death. That was a rambling answer. Yeah. We do have an online question right now. I wonder if Dr. Thiessen could specifically comment on the Gospel of John and how it interacts with ritual impurity. I'm curious about verses like John 15, 3, you're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Does John treat ritual impurity differently than the Synoptic Gospels? Yeah, great question. Uh, I'm not a John scholar and I try not to interact with John um, for lots of different reasons. It's really interesting that John, well, it's potentially interesting that John doesn't have anybody with lepra, doesn't have any genital discharge. Or now, mind you, there's only one story in the Synoptic Gospels, and they all, they all follow Mark, generally. John doesn't also have any exorcisms, uh, which the Synoptic Gospels have. And the Synoptic Gospels refer to demons as impure pumata, um, or impure spirits. So there are some differences. And that could be, it's been sort of traditional, well, I mean, not traditional, but it's been common in the 20th century to think John doesn't know the Synoptic Gospels. And I think that, that tide has changed a bit. Um, 
and maybe John does know synoptics, but then he's not following them on that. And that's interesting, I think, or potentially interesting. The only impure, well, the only clearly impure person is Lazarus, the dead man, who Jesus raises from the dead. Uh, but he doesn't go into the tomb, doesn't touch Lazarus, he just speaks and it happens. But then there's somebody who's ritually impure becoming pure again. Corpse turns to a, a living body. So it's hard to know what to do with that silence. What does that mean? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh. Thanks, Matt, for your great uh, paper tonight. Uh, just a question about Mark 5 and Matthew's redaction of Mark 5 and yeah. Matthew 9. Uh, specifically, the story of Jairus' daughter in Matthew. He's no longer Jairus. He's just a leader. Yep. And the daughter's dead already. Yeah. Yep. So I'm just wondering how that might inform uh, Matthew's understanding of ritual purity, and is it different than Mark's, at yeah. least uh, around that story? Yep. Uh, because I, th I, think, I think Mark 5 is a really interesting Pericope, and it's yeah. a lot less interesting when Matthew gets a hold yep. of it and abbreviates it. So. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, I think Matthew's cleaning up a few things, especially when we get to the hemorrhaging woman. Um, you know, this is how I've always taken it, but if anybody has other thoughts, I'd love to hear them. You know, most scholars think Matthew has Mark and has, has modified it. It certainly accentuates the man's faith if he's coming to Jesus and his daughter's already dead. Deathbed versus dead, uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big jump. And so I think Matthew's version heightens the man's confidence in Jesus' power. It also accentuates Jesus' power. Because uh, it seems to me that the, the, um, the longer a person has been dead, the harder they should be to, ra to, to be raised. Uh, and I don't know if I learned that from Princess Bride or some other, I don't know where I have this principle from, but it seems like it's got to be right, right? Um, and in Mark, it's like shortly after she dies. Matthew, it's, well, a little bit more after she dies. Luke, we have the same story, but then we have the son who is on his way to being buried. So he's been dead longer. And in John, we have Lazarus dead, what, four days. So he's, he's decomposing. As they say, he's, it's going to stink. Um, to bring back someone from the dead, to reach that far into, you know, the realm of death and pull someone out, I think, again, highlights Jesus' power. Now, of course, Matthew has that really wild story in, um, it's a chapter 27, where at the point that Jesus dies, <laughs> corpses pop up in their tombs, um, of the corpses of the holy ones, the saints. And so, again, it's like really emphasizing this power over death, it, it can resurrect or revivify people who've been long dead. So that's how I've read it. I don't know if anybody has a different reading of why Matthew would change that initial on her deathbed to already dead. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm just thinking, is, is, does that tell us something? Is, is Matthew doing something different in terms of? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's possible. I get your point. Um, if, if, that's, if that's something to take into consideration, that's, uh, why not? Um, Jesus is already willing to go see a corpse. Now, that doesn't, again, it's, there's no, nothing wrong with going to a corpse. And in fact, it's a, it's a deed of piety to deal with corpses. Um, to bury them, to tend them and bury them. So it doesn't signify a, a lack of uh, disregard for ritual impurity. And of course, especially if Jesus can raise a corpse, you know, this is one of the, the things the Gospels don't answer. They don't tell us. If Jesus comes into contact with a ritually impure person and that person's, the source of their impurity disappears, does Jesus become impure himself? You know, I and think in my mind, I would say that Probably not, um, but the Gospels don't say. Uh, so 
again, I don't think it signifies anything about Jesus' this sort of disregard for, for impurity. It's just, I can, I can take that force down. Yeah. Mark here, yeah. So, so thank you so much for your paper, and, and I'll, I'll take up where you began as yeah. a theologian as opposed to a biblical scholar. Yeah, fantastic. And, and I, I, I really do appreciate the, the work that you've done on this distinction between sort of ritual purity as not a moral category, yeah. right? And so there, I'm wondering if there's a parallel and what the benefit of, of this is, because clearly you're right to say this may not be any basis whatsoever for supersessionism. That, that we're obligated to think that, that Jesus was, of course, a faithful Jew. Yeah. And then, of course, we're, we're wondering, well, what does this mean about Judaism and Christ, or Jesus, yeah. and what he is doing as a Jew in all of these contexts? Yeah. So for me, there seems to be a parallel between what happened in Bart scholarship and the German, two German translations of the dogmatics okay. into English. And there was a change because early Bart scholars thought the English translation said that uh, God abolishes religion. Uh huh. The German was Alphabung. And it turns out that the better translation of this word is sublimates, takes up and brings it to its fullness as opposed to setting it aside. Okay. And I'm wondering if this is partly what's at stake in ritual purity is that Jesus may not be setting it aside, yeah. but may himself be its fulfillment. Does that, does that make any sense at all? Yeah, let me, I mean, so I'm not a Bart scholar, obviously, uh, but if, uh, who of us doesn't bump into Bart? Uh, we're Bart scholars. Um, I only knew the abolish religion uh, aspect, that sort of reading of, of Bart. So that's really, that's helpful to think about. This is, yeah, let me, how do I, how do I put this? Because again, this is, this, the supersessionism is right around the corner, isn't it? Um, so I think Kazin is right. The gospels depict the kingdom of God coming. It's eschatological. That doesn't mean ritual impurity is less important. It means ritual impurity is being treated. It's being destroyed. Death is being destroyed. That's, I think, what the gospel writers are trying to say, and Paul says it in his own way elsewhere. Um, which sounds really, really awesome. Now it's, of course, 2,000, <laughs> 2000 years later, and we all know death is still kicking around. Um, so it's not, it's, I think Leviticus is, so I use the word defensive and offensive, and I think I'm nervous around that, but I, I think there's something about it. This, the Levitical system is all about, we've got mortal human beings who are messy. We have to come up with a system so that they can dwell with God. And this is the system. And this makes it work. But surely, I think, no one's happy that this is like, this isn't like forever. Surely at some point, God's going to deal with these forces of death and get rid of them. And so um, that's sort of the apocalyptic Judaism that, that arises, especially um, you know, in the, in the fifth, in, in, in later, later centuries. Uh, death is going to be destroyed, which then raises the question, if, if all death is gone, what happens to this system? Well, of course you don't, if there's nobody who's mortal, nobody becomes ritually impure. It doesn't mean that the rules are bad or dumb or anything. It's that humans have been changed. And the, the cosmos has been changed. And so, you know, this is, I think, Revelation and other apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature. There's no more need for a temple, not because purity doesn't matter. It's because everything's been purified. So I, I think that you use the word sub, sublimation. Is that? Yeah. Um, if that is sublimation, then, then yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's not, it's not a criticism of the temple. It's not the temple's, you know, old, 
superseded, it's that the human condition has been superseded, um, which is good, well, not universal Jewish thinking, but many ancient Jews had this hope. Yeah. So yeah. I do now have a comment and a question. I'm happy to say that for the first time. <laughs> and so, um, Philip Yu from the AM&E department at UBC, <laughs> wish I was there. More a comment than a question. William Propp in his anchor Bible, Exodus Commentary, speaks of Peace Tabernacle as equivalent to a modern day nuclear power plant. People with specialized skills and equipment are needed only to make sure that things do not go badly. And I think um, we'd be drawing some parallels there with your radioactivity um, comment perhaps, but thank you for that, Philip. Um, so that was William Propp, uh, anchor Bible, Exodus Commentary. Comment from, or excuse me, a question from another guest. <clears throat> so, what do you see that Matthew and the other Gospels are saying about how we should deal or relate with those who are ritually impure? And I asked, do you, do you mean those in the past or those today? Yeah. And he said, both then and now. And I think he, a connection is being made perhaps to people who are considered marginalized today. Yeah. So that, that, there's a lot going on in that question, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, how, how to jump the gap between the ancient world and our modern world. Uh, you know, I, I don't think, I'm not advocating we start thinking about ritual purity. Um, and I think there are a variety of reasons. Uh, a, so I, I mean, I can answer this histor sort of from a historical perspective, which is more my, my expertise. According to most scholars of ancient Judaism, the ritual purity laws only apply to ancient Jews, not to Gentiles. Why? Because it's only ancient Jews who can go into the temple area. Um, Gentiles have the outer courtyard, the courtyard of the Gentiles uh, in the Herodian temple, but uh, that's relatively far from the temple. They don't need to be ritually pure at least according to any legislation we know of. Um, so, A, it doesn't apply from a Jewish perspective to Gentiles. B, if the temple's destroyed, ritual purity is not sort of much of a live issue. Uh, and then, you know, I would go again to this, I think there are, there are resources in Christian theology around uh, if one wants to think about purity and holiness and impurity, uh, the move that Christian theologians make pretty early. Um, oh, it's also, oh, maybe it is the Didascalia Apostolorum as well. Uh, it was, it was a, a practice for some Christians to dine at the graves of saints, which seems really wild if you're thinking about corpse contamination. And the argument Oh, I think it's the Didascalia Apostolorum, but don't quote me on that. Uh, the argument that gets made is actually pointing back to the, the Old Testament and the corpse of Elisha, who's in a tomb. And some Israelites are coming to bury another dead man, and they're about to be attacked. And they throw the dead body <laughs> into the cave where Elisha's corpse is, and it touches the corpse and comes back to life. A corpse revivifies another corpse. And the argument that these early Christian theologians make is the Holy Spirit is clearly there because Elisha is a saint. And you would think it's impure, but the Holy Spirit is more powerful than even the impurity of a corpse. The, the Holy Spirit still lingers on in the remains of uh, the saints. And so that's why we dine there and we don't become impure. And so, you know, if, if, if I guess I would say this uh, dynamic of impurity and holiness, there are sort of theological resources one could point to if one wanted to for how the Holy Spirit sort of uh, overpowers any impurities that one might think of, which then does, does talk about inclusivity in its way, but it's not... Um, not in like a morally superior way, I think. At least I hope. Yeah. We do have time for, I think, another question. Is, is there a remaining question, perhaps? I have one for this, I guess. Andrew here. 
Thanks, Matt. Um, I've been sitting there trying to think about how to ask this quickly. Um, <laughs> you won't be surprised by my question. So and you've been talking about, and we have these very nice, you know, binary uh, sets, which I always want to push against. Um, so my one big question would be, when we talk about spaces, so the two spaces that yeah. we've been talking about are obviously the temple, and then to a lesser degree, obviously, a home where there's potentially a dead person or in another version, a dead person. What do we do with spaces like, say, the synagogue, which yeah. is obviously not unimportant for the ministry of Jesus? Um, now, I mean, Josephus, another writer who's writing Second Temple stories after the fall of the temple, um, very clearly connects synagogues with uh, especially law books and the Sabbath, both of which are... Yep. You know, intrinsically holy, um, or possibly, and Philo does to a lesser de degree as well. So, do you see there being any relevance here? I mean, I, I know that you purposely, in this work, keep away from historical Jesus. Yeah. But I mean, can you see anything that's maybe implied? I mean, the same way that you know, a corpse being there implies. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, uh, you're the synagogue guy here, not me. Uh, so I'll defer to you about what kind of sanctity uh, synagogues had. And of course, who knows, maybe some Jews thought they were and other Jews didn't. Um, but I don't think it's, and this is something that I think we have to keep reminding ourselves. I have to keep reminding myself. Uh, just because there's a temple, and also, A, there's a temple in Jerusalem, but not all um, who are broadly construed under Israel think that's, well, A, sacred space, or B, the only sacred space. Samaritans, we have Jews down in Elephantini, which, uh, you know, it's debatable what they thought about the Jerusalem temple, right? You know this. Um, and maybe there were other sacred spaces, maybe not quite as sacred. I don't think it's just... You know, even the temple itself is like most holy and holy, and then you move out in its gradations of holiness. Maybe there are other, um, well, sa satellite campuses. Uh, that's such a modern term, but it just came to mind. There are other sort of outposts. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm happy to consider that. I think that's. I think we have to, and I think, you know. Maybe it's not even competing. It's non-competing centers of holiness. Uh, it's uh, Benjamin Summers' fantastic book, The Bodies of God, is, is I think, what I try to keep returning to. Uh, God can inhabit multiple bodies, multiple places at the same time. It doesn't have to be in competition. And I really think that explains a lot of what uh, early Jesus followers are up to. Paul thinks Jesus has multiple bodies. And they're not in competition with each other. So why does the temple have to be in competition with those bodies too? Um, so maybe that's the same with tabernacles. I don't know. I haven't followed up on the research lately on uh, what people are thinking about whether these are temple-esque locations. But you're right, with, with Torah scrolls and stuff, what kind of holiness is, is located there? Yeah, thanks for the question. How about one final question? I'll, I'll reserve it for myself. Just um, in a general question, what, what's a takeaway for, for Christians who are not biblical scholars, who, who don't necessarily study these texts all the time? Yeah. What, what, what's a takeaway when they read these stories in Mark 5? Yep. Uh, how are they to understand ritual impurity? What, what's a takeaway for them? Yeah. Well, so A, uh, I think it's really important uh, to really stress that the Gospels aren't trying to depict Jesus against Judaism. And so that's really important, I think, for Christian theology, or ought to be important for Christian theology. Um, that's the simple first takeaway uh, in a nutshell. I think the second, and, and this is something I, I repeatedly come back to, uh, I can't speak for Catholic theology. I can certainly speak, well, <laughs> from my experience of, of certain segments of Protestant theology, uh, 
there's a real disconnect between Jesus' life and Jesus' death uh, in resurrection. And, you know, growing up, I, I never really knew what Jesus was doing for 30 years. Felt like he was sort of wasting time because the whole point was to come and die. Uh, so, like, 30 years, like, why? Why, why, what are you doing? Uh, maybe throwing out a few, you know, uh, witty, witty sayings and stuff. But if, if the Gospels are trying to depict this sort of broad-scale purification mission, and these miracles aren't just fireworks, uh, they're also showing Jesus already fighting with the forces of impurity and death. It really connects Jesus' life and his death in, a, in a, a way that at least growing up I didn't pick up on. And maybe that was my own uh, obtuseness, but I think the gospel narratives are more than just, they're more than just a passion narrative with a prologue. Um, the prologue is really important too. The life is really important because it's, it's all of a, of a piece. That gets to your question, John. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you.